Okay, so good morning. Welcome to uh, to 45 minutes on, on my business story and um, the lessons learned during that time. Um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk through the story, run through some, uh, I say, 10 lessons learned, a very, very brief uh, outline of what I'm doing now, then we'll have a QA. and a um, and then what I'm going to do at the end of today, or the, sorry, the end of the session is I'm going to post something on LinkedIn, if you could, uh, I'll, say, I'll put the link in the chat at the end, if you can go there at the end, have a, put a comment on there, any feedback, good or bad, please do so, um, and that'd be great. So, um, kitchen table digital startup to multi-million pound sale in 18 years. Obviously, I could have spent an hour, two hours, probably half a day telling you the story. So what I've tried to do is, is condense it down into, into sort of seven key points of what happened during that journey. Um, I'm not going to use lots of numbers and, and graphs and things like that. So I've, I've got a, a variety of, of uh, pictures and stories to tell you to, to, to sort of illustrate the tale. So the story started back in 2000 when I, hang on, it's not working. Oh, there you go. Um, I was recruited by William Hill um, to launch the, what was their first ever online casino. Um, and while I was there, we came across the concept of online bingo. So I was tasked with uh, going out, researching the market, and coming back and doing a presentation back to the uh, back to the board as to whether they should whether they should get into the sector or not. I did that, did the presentation. They decided no. We don't want to get into online bingo, which was interesting because they did about eight years later. Um, at the end of the year, I left William Hill um, and and went out into the market as a as an online gaming consultant. Um, back in those days, having had a year's experience in online gaming, um, I was pretty much um, you know in the, the kingdom of the blind. I was the one-eyed man, so I knew more than most people in that sector. So I was talking to, I was working with people like Gala, Littlewoods Gaming, Victor Chandlers, people like that. Um, and I was, I was actually talking to a friend of my brother's and he wanted to get into online gaming because it was this exciting new sector. And I said, you know what? You want to get into online bingo. That's going to be the next big thing. And then a couple of days later, I thought, hang on a minute. Why am I, you know, why am I telling somebody to do that and I'm not actually doing it? So, so what I did was I, I dusted off the William Hill presentation, reshaped it slightly um, and put together a pitch document, this document here, uh, 57 pages of really, actually reading it now, really boring stuff, um, and took it out into the market, Dragon's Den style, um, to try and get funding for what would have been the UK's first ever pay-to-play online bingo site. Now, just to, just to explain the landscape of the time, um, the only place that had online bingo at the time was the US. And in the US, there were about a dozen websites that were, that were offering this. Um, and the, 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 the legality there was a bit gray. It wasn't illegal to play online bingo or online, any type of online gambling, but it wasn't legal. There wasn't a legal structure for it. So it was legally gray. So that was the first point. The second point was obviously going out to the market. The first question anybody asked was, if this is gonna be so brilliant, how come Mecca and Gala aren't doing it? You know, they're the big boys in the market. If this is gonna be so fantastic, Phil, you know, why aren't they doing it? Yeah, the obvious answer to that is they were huge monoliths, you know, huge big companies making loads of money with land-based bingo. They hadn't even, well, it was just coming onto their radar. So they hadn't done it, but that was an obvious question. If the, you know, if this isn't happening, why aren't the big boys doing it? The third thing was, I was taking this pitch out. This is a startup online business right at the time that the dot-com bubble was bursting. So, me going out there asking for a quarter of a million pounds for a million valued at a million pounds this this nothing business um with something that was legally gray uh the big boys weren't interested and uh the dot-com bubble was about to burst so as you might expect um i didn't get any money at all i didn't get any funding whatsoever this was a screenshot of what online bingo looked like at the time and i took this round and I actually 
um, in, in a couple of presentations I did, they didn't have, I didn't have access to PowerPoint. I had this stuck on a piece of cardboard. And I've, actually st I've actually still got this somewhere. This was my screenshot of what it looked like. So I went out of the market, didn't get a single penny. However, what I'd done is I'd built a very, very basic website um, that listed all of the US bingo sites that were out there. And on it, I'd put a very, very simple pop-up to generate some, some data. And, and actually I found a screenshot of what it looked like. This is how dreadful my website looked like. I'm embarrassed to show you this. But this pop-up here allowed me to collate things like age, sex, spend, frequency, all that sort of stuff. Um, and allowed me to stand in these business presentations or these pitch presentations to look like an expert in the market. Fantastic. But what happened was, the bingo sites that were listed on this website started to contact me and say, Phil, can we advertise on your website? I said, well, you know, send me some money and, and I'll put some ads on. And that is how the business started. A complete and utter accident. Complete accident. So, started off myself and my wife. Now, working from home, um, I remember wife sending blocks of emails out on Outlook Express with a kid sat on a, on, a, on a lap and all that sort of stuff. Now, we've all seen this picture. This is a picture of Jeff Bezos in his, I think it's his garage, if I remember rightly, the start of Amazon. I have exactly the same picture. This is me in 2011, or not 2011, sorry, 2001, um, in my office for my startup. Now, those of you who are very, uh, very good at looking there, top right hand corner, you'll see, yes, that is the leg of an upturned bed. This is what a startup looks like. Um, just in the top right, you'll see a sort of pale green writing on there. That's a, a poster my daughter at the time wrote, and it says something along the lines of, this is an office, do not come in, my daddy will shout. That's startup, that's what we look like. So, um, at the time, I was actually still looking for a proper job. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure about this and actually did manage to find a proper job. I got a very good, very good job offer as an account director at a digital agency. Um, and on the Friday before the Monday that I was due to start, I went in to see them and said, I'm really sorry, I can't, I can't take this job. I've got this thing that might happen, this business opportunity that might happen. Now, at that point, I had no idea whether this was going to work or not. But that was that was a that was probably the first key turning point where I went right. Okay, we're going all in on this, and and you know, let's see let's see how we get on. Um, so we spent the first four four and a half years working from home. Myself and my wife. We had a couple of freelancers working for us, and everything started moving moving forward quite nicely um, until the point where one of the freelancers came in and said. Bill, I'm getting myself a full-time job. So this is 2005. This is the first sort of stick. Well, this is probably the second stick or twist point of the story. So we go, shit, what do we do? Do we, do we, you know, do we get another, do we get another freelancer in? Um, or do we, shit, do we like, do we go for it properly? So we actually got the, the city council was supporting some business support at the time. I don't remember what it was. And we got a, um, we got this business advisor in and, and sort of for the first time sort of showed him the business. It was the first time we really showed anybody this is a proper real business. I'm very, very scared. Sort of said, well, this is what it looks like. What do you think? And he said, go for it. So May 2005, we took the hugely scary step of taking on an office and two members of staff. And if you look at this picture, those of you in North Leeds will recognize that Slade Hill. Um, the two windows just behind the uh, the the, uh, the light um, uh, above the sort of uh, nice bunches of flowers. Those two windows were our first ever office, and we recruited two members of staff. We recruited two because we thought it might be just to be a little bit weird with uh, myself, my wife, and one person sitting there working for us. We thought that might be a bit a bit odd, so we recruited two members of staff. And by then, we'd actually started building a number of different websites. So we actually had, and this is sort of the portfolio we had at the time. So the Witchbingo UK at the top, that had only just launched. Witchbingo.com was our major 
US site, and that was the one I was bringing all the money. We just launched freebingo.co.uk, which is a free bingo site. Um, and then the three at the bottom were additional portfolios, uh, portfolio sites, which were also generating revenue. The idea being, and this was my this was my sort of rough master plan at the time, was if we had five different bingo portals, we might be able to get the top five sites, top five positions in the Google listings. Um, a sort of, you know, a, a plaster everywhere with, with our stuff, you know, wherever the money came in, it didn't really matter. And that was going okay. So, so the, the, the exciting thing of the new office was May 2005. Now, on Friday, November the 18th, 2006, this happened. The US brought in UIGA, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act. What that did overnight was make it illegal for banks to fund online gaming. So as an online gaming, as a, as a bingo player or a casino player or a sports betting player, you couldn't use a US bank to fund your account. This killed the internet, sorry, this killed online gaming in the US dead. This happened on a Friday night and we spent, my wife and I spent the whole weekend determining or trying to work out who we should get rid of. We had three modes of staff at the time, and that was horrible. And actually, we came to the conclusion at the end of that, that actually the, the amount of money we'd saved getting rid of one person really wasn't, really, really wasn't worth it. Um, so we stuck with it and we carried on. And actually what happened was the whole of the US gaming industry, the online gaming industry came to the UK, which was great because we had a website, which being UK, sitting there waiting. Now, one of the other things that happened, or, or happened accidentally really, was, and this is sort of slightly inside, one of the parts of the online bingo sector is you can create what are called skins, white label, sort of own brand bingo sites. And over the sort of first five or six years, lots of people came to us and said, look, you've got the traffic coming to the portals. Would you like one of our skins? So we ended up with this portfolio. There's seven of them there. We had a couple more at, at, at certain times of the of the journey of of actual online bingo sites to play at so these were sort of white label versions of what my original plan was so over sort of since uiga everything started to grow in the uk and and, and we you know we carried on growing and 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 everything was doing all right and then about 2008 somebody came to us and said i'd be interested in buying the business which is a bit of a shock to us um and, and one of the things that came out of that was, um, firstly, that the potential buyer didn't want these skins that you see there. And the second thing was that really it wasn't sellable because I was, I, was, I was the business. Um, and what we did was, at that point, this was probably the second time we brought somebody external in. We brought a, a consultant in to really review the business uh, and sort of decide you know, where we were going to go next. So... This was sort of what I would I would perceive as sort of like the teenage years of the business. So, you know, we know what we do. We're doing all right. We're not listening to anybody. And this was sort of the first stage where we went, oh, OK, we, we need to start getting a bit serious about this. And we brought a guy in. And what he did was fantastic. He sat down with the team and asked them what they thought. And he asked me what I thought of the business and where I thought we were going. And, and, and my wife was still involved, um, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but was still involved um, strategically, what, what she thought. And he then came back with a plan for us. And what he created, he introduced me to this book. You may or may not have heard of it. Brilliant book it's by a guy called Jim Collins, Good to Great. One of the key parts of that book is this. It's written down here as the hedgehog concept. But most people know it's the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. And you can create a BHAG by being passionate about what you do, being the best at what you could do, and also doing something that creates money. And he created this for us. This was our BHAG. Become the world's number one source of online bingo players. Now, if you want a big, hairy, audacious goal to become the world's number one source of online bingo players, bearing in mind at this time there were five of us in an office over a sandwich shop in North Leeds, that's quite a big, hairy, audacious goal. That was stuck on our meeting, we, we had it on an A3 sheet, we got it laminated, that was stuck on our, our meeting room walls from that day onwards. But what he also did 
was he identified that we needed more staff because actually we were constricted by the number of staff we had. We weren't, be, we weren't able to, to really expand. But also, and this is probably the first seed of, of preparing to sell the business, he said I needed to start letting go. And those two things, those three things really made a difference. What we also did off the back of the, uh, the company that, that had inquired about the business, we hived off the bingo skins into a separate company, a company called Spotlight Online Gaming. So again, so this, this is where we're at sort of mid-stage growth stage. And again, we took stuff on, we increased, and we did better until this happened. Now, those of you who, who are in uh, the online business will probably recognize Google Panda, Google Penguin. These were two major algorithmic changes, and they hit us. They actually hit the whole of the online gaming sector but they hit us quite badly. Um, so this was a real dip for us. What we did at that point, we had to, and again, this was, this was Google Act. I mean, we saw it as a problem at the time, but this was Google actually telling everybody, clean up your act, you need a better quality website to rank on Google. So we took that on board. But as a short-term thing, we actually acquired another bingo portal because they hadn't been hit so badly and they were still ranking very well. So that increased our portfolio even further. Um, and it took us a while to, to really drill through that. And then the next major point in the process, and this is quite a big turning point for us, was around 2012. Um, and this isn't meant to sound arrogant, but um, I got bored with the business. It was doing fine. Um, we were doing very well. There was money coming in. It was starting to run itself. And, and I got bored. Um, and I wanted a new challenge. So the solution to my new challenge, or my, my desire for a new challenge, was to put the business up for sale. Which obviously, you know, this was, I'd say 2012, so we're now sort of 10 years into the business journey here. Um, and again, that was, that was a very, very big decision. So we, we approached a local corporate finance company. Um, they put together a whole... Um, uh, information memorandum, took it out to the market, and we did, you know, we did the whole beauty parade, and we went to see, I think it's probably about half a dozen different people we went to see, and we actually ended up with an offer. Um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a mind-blowing offer, but it was, it was sort of market value, it was okay, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was great, and, and the offer came in over a bank holiday weekend, um, and the offer came in the Friday, um, Jane and I spent them three days chucking this around and by the end of Monday we decided we weren't going to sell we for various reasons we got cold feet um I went back to the broker on the Tuesday morning to say look we've changed our mind we're not going to sell um she wasn't unsurprisingly she wasn't overly happy about that but we'd also had a plan we always had a plan b um as part of a part of the the, the business for sale thing on you know, on the basis of we, we might not be able to sell. And plan B was to get somebody else in to run it. Now that actually was was a win win because that allowed me to step back because at the time I said I was I was a bit bored, but it allowed us to keep the asset and keep running the business. So um, we said right, okay, bring plan B in. Now plan B was to recruit somebody and. This is the guy I recruited, the guy called Simon Jones. Simon did a brilliant job for us. But before I talk about what Simon did to change the business, um, there's a couple of things. Just an interesting thing as to how I, how I did the recruitment. Now, obviously, normal recruitment process, you know, you speak to a recruitment agency, they send you CVs, you do an interview, you do a second interview, you give them the job. And I don't know, I can't remember where I picked this idea up from, but what I decided to do, because I needed to have a very, very tight relationship with this person, whoever was to take this job. So I needed to know I could get on with this person, you know, connect on a, on a personal level. So what we told the recruitment consultants were, was we, we were going to do a, almost like a pre-first interview, which was just meet, some, meet for a cup of coffee. No CVs, no, you know, what did you go here? What did you do there? No, it was just a coffee. And that was very clearly explained to all the candidates that, that we had. And that was absolutely amazing. Absolutely fascinating from a, just, just, just from what came out of it. Because despite every single candidate knowing this was a, it wasn't a formal interview, it was, it was part of the interview process. I got so much more 
out of the people sitting in front of me that I would have done in just a normal a normal interview. So actually, the first tick box I had to tick was, can I get on with this person? And then it was, okay, let's talk through your CV, let's talk about you know how you could do this job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the second interview was the formal CV interview. Um, and the third interview was, we did a right, okay, can you do the job? And that was actually, we gave them a task, we gave them a scenario with the clients and said, okay, how would you, how would you do this? And what would, and, and also we did a, um, what would you do in your first 90 days? And that again, was really, really interesting. Cause again, it, that's now looking at, can you do the job? Um, so Simon came on board and um, actually culturally made a lot of changes to the business. Um, and I'll come on to those in a minute, but I'll, I just want to go on a, on a side here and just talk about the team. Because we had a very, very close knit team. And um, what you'll see here, um, everybody who ever joined our team from day one, their first in their first week, part of their induction was we took them to play bingo. Now, I'd never played bingo before I started this business, but what it did, it actually was was it worked in a couple of different ways. Obviously, it was social and we got to meet the team and all that sort of stuff. But it actually got them to understand under the skin of bingo and the bingo player. And I think apart from one person we recruited, nobody ever played bingo before. But they all came out afterwards, went, wow, that was really good. I really enjoyed that. I can see why people get excited about this. Um, what we also did with all our teams, again, from day one, we gave everybody their birthday off. I had the caveat of if it was over the weekend, hard cheese. Um, we took them on trips. Um, top left, you'll see, you know, we event over our over the period, we won 10 different awards. You can see them on here. So we'd often take them down to London, pay for them all for big award ceremonies. The picture bottom left is a trip we took to Barcelona, actually quite near the end of, of, of our time. Um, and, you know, the team was very, very important. And one of the things I did sort of towards the end of, sort of halfway through towards the end was, was I started in weekly, half an hour one-on-ones with the team, with each individual member of the team, which was great. And it allowed them to, to say whatever they wanted, whatever time they wanted. So what Simon did, actually, Simon actually took that to the next level because what we'd done is we got slightly complacent and, and, and he got rid of some of the deadwood. Um, but what we also did was we really stepped up our game. And again, this was down to Simon challenging me. I remember one of the things he said in his interview was, are you willing to let go? Because he wanted to put his stamp on what he was doing. And I said, yeah, sure, you know, go for it, knock yourself out. And actually gave, uh, gave me a new boost because I now had somebody to mentor, I had somebody to guide, I had somebody to discuss strategy with, and, and we really stepped up our game. Now, that included a number of major, major things. We did another major overhaul of the website. I think it was version four of the website eventually. The picture in the top middle is actually our TV ad. We ran a TV ad on national TV, which was, again, you know, that's a step up from, from everybody else. Um, we started on the left, you can see our annual uh, bingo report. That was a B2B industry report. Again, took us up another level, made us stand out from everybody else. And we also created our own industry awards, the Witch Bingo Awards. Um, I'd, we'd, we'd done something that wasn't an event for a number of years. And my team natted me eventually said, look, we've got to do a proper event. So we, we started doing this event. The first one we did um, they're all down in London. The first one we did was uh, Millbank Tower. The second one we did was at um, uh, Madame Two Swords. And this, those of you who are of a certain age will recognize that is Kerry Katona. Now, Kerry Katona used to have, I mentioned bingo skins earlier. Kerry Katona had a bingo skin called Play, called Bingo with Kerry or something like that. And she won one of our awards. Um, and that gave us some huge PR. So this really stepped us up. At the time, we also. Um, we got rid of our, our bingo skins business, the spotlight online gaming business, um, and really started motoring. And then this is probably three years, so we're now 2016, so three years into Simon's Simon's time with me. He was he was, you know, we were really, he was really challenging me strategically. And what we did, uh, we had a number of different options as to what we did and and, and what where we were going to go next. And, and the solution we came up with was actually to bring somebody externally. So we brought in this guy, Mark Prince. Um, and what he did was fantastic. He sat down with the team and did one-on-ones with everybody. And then we had a like a huge blue skies day um, 
with him and, and what the team had said. And there were a number of major thoughts. You know, there was quite a lot came out of that. The key one, and this is, this is fascinating, the key one was the team wanted me to keep my fucking nose out of the business. Because I kept coming in as an excited entrepreneur. I kept coming in every six weeks with a brand new, brilliant idea. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And six weeks later, um, I'd come in with a new one and go, right, we're going to do this. And they go, well, what about that one? Oh, forget that one. That's We're not going to go with that. And then I'd then also be, you know, why haven't you done that on, on the Witch Bingo site? They go, well, Phil, we're doing this fantastic, exciting new project that you've brought us in. So, so actually, I was damaging the business. And in fact, what Mark recommended was that I create a second business to put my exciting new stuff in, which I actually did. So I had a second business which had all my exciting stuff in, and I was told to bloody leave the business alone and, 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 and mind my own business, which Simon loved because it gave him all the, all, the, uh, all the power, which was great. It was fantastic for me. Um, the other thing that came out was to be single-minded and focused. And you know, I've mentioned a number of times we had a portfolio of websites and what, I, what came out of this was just concentrate on which bingo. So we dropped everything, we sold the free bingo site and we focused specifically on which bingo. He also brought us in regular recording of stats, which is something we hadn't done previously. Again, it tends to happen with owner managed businesses because you know it's quite small. I just, you know, I hear things verbally, I don't need re recording. He brought that in. So he really, really stepped, to, stepped our game up. And then in 2017, and this was summer 2017, uh, we were contacted by the, the industry was, was actually had about half a dozen big um, businesses that were, that were buying up smaller businesses. We got contacted by one of them and said, right, we want to buy your business and gave us a very big number. Oh, wow. OK. And we'd always said at the time, or we always said throughout, you know, you know, any quite happy to sell as long as somebody gives us enough money in very, very simple terms. Um, so we went down to London, met these guys, and actually the the offer, the wonderful offer they gave us, was, we had lots of caveats. It was a lot of yes, buts, and earn outs, and this and that and the other, and, and, it, and it wasn't, it, what, the big figure wasn't the big figure. So what I did, and because the industry is quite small, what I did was I contacted all of the, the other companies who were pulling stuff together. I said, look, we're not for sale, but now might be a very good time to speak to us if you're interested. And one of them came back to us uh, and made us a very good offer, not as good as the, the first one, made us a very good offer. And we thought, right, we're on for a deal here. I was at the point of signing heads of terms that week when one of the other ones, one of the other uh, companies contacted us back and said, Phil, we want to buy you. And I said, well, look, you know, my my word is my bond you know i've told these people we haven't signed your paper but i've told these people you know we're going to go with them you know i don't like letting people down um but if you want us to change horses you've got to make a much better offer you know it's got to move the dial and it's got to be better structured and to his credit the guy came back to me two days later verbally we agreed an offer um I had to go back to the first, the, the second company and say, look, really sorry, um, you know, we can't do it, which was, again, a difficult call. Um, and we, we verbally agreed the deal on a couple of emails and a phone call, a couple of phone calls, a couple of emails in November. And the deal went through, in, the deal went through on the 12th of April, 2018. A week later, these were the headlines that were splashed across the industry. Nobody knew what was going on. This was quite a shock to everybody. Now, everybody talks about, you know, you set up a business, you want to sell it, and all that is wonderful, and, you know, champagne corks and all that sort of thing. It's actually very, very different. One of the things, this company was a PLC, it was a non-UK PLC. They didn't want any of my team for various reasons. I, you know, I didn't agree with it but anyway that's it so I actually had and this was this of the whole 18 years this was the hardest thing I had to do I had to walk into a meeting room with 14 staff and say hey guys I've sold the business yay um but actually the buyers don't want you you've got three months and that's it now you know, you've seen the pictures of the team and, and, and all the stuff we did with them. That was the most difficult thing I've ever, ever done. 
in Everton. And interestingly, I'm still in contact with a lot of the team. Um, and actually, sort of the week after it happened, many of them came into my office and said, look, Phil, you've, you know, don't blame you. You've done the right thing. A couple of them are actually, were actually did, recording a podcast this week and we're actually talking about that meeting from the other side. And it's interesting to hear, hear what, what they said. Um, if you want to hear that, it, I actually commented on my LinkedIn. So if you go on my LinkedIn, you'll see a link to the, to the discussion. Um, so that is, uh, how long does that take? Let's take half an hour. It's 18 years in half an hour. 